An eccentric claims he can travel through time with this warning, safety not guaranteed. A group of aging Brits travel to the best exotic Marigold Hotel. Steve Carell and Kira Knightley are seeking a friend for the end of the world. And two young people run away to their moonrise kingdom. Grab the popcorn and settle in. It's time for Slick Flicks. Hello and welcome to Slick Flicks. I'm Paul Gibbs. And I'm Patrick Gibbs. Summer is the busiest movie season of the year, and we've had some great blockbusters this summer, from Marvel's The Avengers to Disney Pixar's Brave. But while everybody is going to go see those movies, there are a lot of high-quality films that people aren't hearing about and aren't going to see. And that's what we decided to base this episode around. So rather than spending this episode on movies that you've already seen or are already intent on seeing, regardless of what we have to say about them, we decided we want to bring a few smaller films to your attention that are just as deserving of an audience, but are not getting the same kind of talk that those other films are and aren't penciled in on your must-see list. First up, Paul will be reviewing the Steve Carell and Keira Knightley comedy drama Seeking a Friend for the End of the World. But is it really the end of the world for anyone if they don't see this movie? Not quite, but they should see it. As Seeking a Friend for the End of the World begins, we learn that an asteroid named Matilda is headed for Earth, threatening an extinction-level event of the type so common in late 1990s blockbusters. The mission of the astronauts sent to destroy the asteroid has failed, and in 21 days, humankind will be no more. Dodge, played by Steve Carell, a wishy-washy insurance salesman, finds that his wife responds to the news by immediately leaving him, and he is now facing the end of the world alone. Enter Penny, played by Kira Knightley, the girl in the apartment next door. Penny is the sort of free spirit we always see in quirky independent comedy dramas, and has an on-again, off-again relationship with a deadbeat boyfriend played by Adam Brody. A series of unusual circumstances leaves Dodge and Penny both seemingly condemned to die alone, both full of regret about the disappointing lives they led and the relationships that failed. With no other way to face the end of the world, they decide to help each other. Dodge will find the lost high school sweetheart that he believes was his true love, and who, it turns out, wrote him a letter proclaiming her love shortly before his wife left him, and Penny will return to her family in England. After having suffered through Deep Impact and Armageddon, two competing asteroid disaster films that proved that two completely different approaches to the same subject could lead to more or less equally awful films, it's extremely satisfying to see screenwriter and first-time director Loreen Scafaria turn the same scenario into a film that is hilarious, touching, depressing, and life-affirming all at the same time. Seeking a Friend for the End of the World rises above its somewhat formulaic indie elements create two extremely vivid central characters in whom we are genuinely engaged. Some of this is due to Scafaria's screenplay, and some is due to excellent performances from both Carell and Knightley. Viewers who are used to Carell only as the boorish Michael Scott from The Office, or the dim-witted Brick Tamlin from Anchorman, may be quite surprised to see such a deep, subtle, and sensitive characterization here. Carell is, of course, hilarious in the aforementioned worlds, and he's demonstrated before in such films as Little Miss Sunshine that he's a more well-rounded performer than we might think. But his work here definitively proves that he has the potential to be as good with drama as he is with comedy, and leaves me very excited about what we're going to see from him in the future. Knightley seems to have fallen a bit out of favor since her heyday, but she reminds us here what the big deal was with a performance that's charming, funny, and at times heartbreaking. These are two performers I never would have seen as an obvious pairing, but the chemistry between them is first-rate, providing the heart and soul of the film. Lorene Scafaria demonstrates that she is a considerable talent, whose screenplay alternates between a hilarious portrayal of the crazy things people might do if the world were coming to an end, to shocking and disturbing visions of the same, to a touching examination of the joys of life. Her handling of the camera is deft, and the cast is uniformly strong. Scafaria could turn out to be a major presence in the future. Seeking a friend for the end of the world may have a little too depressing and heavy a subject matter for some, 
but its combination of sentimental sweetness and comic bite was irresistible to me. I give it an A, and it's very likely to end up on my list of the best films of 2012. I loved this film. It was just, it was an utter surprise to me. I'll be honest, the day before uh, the screening, I considered skipping out on this film because I thought it was either going to be a downer or just the same old thing uh, from Steve Carell. I have a tendency, I, I love him as Michael Scott on The Office, but you can only take so much of it. Right. And I have a tendency to go into a Steve Carell movie with my mind made up that I'm just going to see more of the same old thing and this was really a wake up call. I've got to stop doing that because in this movie he shows we've got the next Tom Hanks here. Right. We're used to seeing him as that obnoxious character, but he's really a likable good guy throughout this film. And it, incredibly Tom Hanks likable. Is, is a very good comparison. He shows that same ability to just drive a movie and carry it with that simple humanity and charisma that made Hank so unforgettable in his 1990s movies. Right, absolutely. And while it's going to take a while for people to fully accept and transition, at some point I can see Carell in a Saving Private Ryan, and he's that good an actor. I, I, I agree. And it's just such a... It, it, it's just such an interesting movie. It just makes you think about a lot of things. I... Was, I spent the next couple of days after thinking about what I would do if I had 21 days left before the end of the world like this one. It's a haunting film. There are a lot of aspects of it that really are haunting. I think if I had to pick a favorite individual moment that just really hit me, um, it's Carell's delivery of one simple line, which is when he's showing Knightley a picture of uh, his long lost love and she asks is she the one that got away and he says simply well they all got away yeah he, that, he, was, that was just a moment where I thought okay Oscar's in the bag give it to him I'd like to thank everybody else who lost now I don't think it's that cut and dried but he should no. be given some consideration I, I, I think that he and Kira Knightley will both probably be forgotten when the Oscars roll around which but is they, an, sh they it, should be considered and that's an absolute shame because like you said it's not really cool to like Kira Knightley anymore. Maybe that's going to start to come back in, but honestly, I completely fell in love with her in this movie. She was wonderful. She, I, she was adorable, charming. You really cared about her. And it was kind of a stock independent film character, even not just independent. Honestly, there were elements of the character that reminded me of... Um, Marie from the Bourne films. It was that kind of free spirit, has lived everywhere, all tons of boyfriends kind of right. person. It, it could have easily been a tired, independent movie formula character, but she brought so much warmth and humanity to her that you just loved her. You, you, you wanted to spend the last few hours of your time on Earth with this character, so why wouldn't he? I should mention that the movie is rated R primarily for strong language. There are some sexual references, things right. of that nature. As well as uh, questionable, but let's be honest, hysterically funny scene of a little kid uh, drinking at a party. The, yes, that, that is funny. And, and there, is a, there are some moments of violence, too. Right. So this, this it's, movie, it's not for everyone. No, it's, no, it's not. Aside from those content concerns, like I said, this, this just simply may be too, too depressing a subject matter for some people. It, it is, don't, people should not just jump to the conclusion because it's Steve Carell that this is going to be lightly funny, and they shouldn't jump to the conclusion that because it's a love story with comic elements that it's going to have a happy ending. Right. It is a movie about the end of the world, and it doesn't, pull away from that it doesn't no it doesn't but at the same time as I said I I considered skipping out on this film because I was thinking it was going to be a downer and with everything that you just said it still didn't play as a downer for me I left the movie with a strange feeling of happiness uh, and an over overriding thought that 
life is what we get out, get out of it, and we can make every moment count. Right. It's a life-affirming movie, even if it's downbeat at times. Yeah. This, it's really amazing, like you said, asteroid movies just kind of became the synonym yeah. for crap uh, to me after that one-two punch of Deep Impact and Armageddon and the fact that the secret to doing something good with it was to just forget about the huge effects and whether we were the people on Earth bracing for it or whether we were the astronauts and oil drillers up on the moon and just focus on the subtle human drama of what do you do in your last days. This was really a triumph for the less is more idea of filmmaking and that story and character can far outweigh what gives the biggest bang for your buck. Absolutely. Next up, Patrick will be reviewing another quirky comedy drama with a bit of a science fiction theme. This time, it's time travel in Safety Not Guaranteed. Patrick, can you guarantee our audiences will like this one? Well, obviously there are no guarantees, but absolutely they need to give this film a chance. Darius Britt is a disillusioned college graduate who lives at home with her widower father and interns at a Seattle magazine. One of the magazine's writers, Jeff Schwenson, proposes to investigate a newspaper classified ad that reads, Wanted. Somebody to go back in time with me. This is not a joke. You'll get paid after we get back. Must bring your own weapons. I have only done this once before. Safety not guaranteed. Jeff's story idea is approved by his boss, Bridget, and he selects two interns, Darius as well as Arnaud, a studious biology major interning at the magazine to diversify his resume, to assist him. They travel to the seaside community of Ocean View, Washington, to find and profile the person behind the ad. Jeff later reveals an ulterior motive for this assignment to track down his long-lost love interest, who lives in the beach community. Darius, played by the charmingly unique Aubrey Plaza, discovers that the person behind the ad is Kenneth Calloway, who works as a stock clerk at a local grocery store. Jeff orders Darius to make contact, and her disaffected attitude serves her well. She quickly endears herself to Kenneth as she poses as a candidate to accompany him on his mission while Kenneth, who is brilliantly portrayed by Mark Duplass, is paranoid and believes that secret agents are tracking his every move, Darius gains his trust as she participates in a series of training exercises in the woods around his house. And as the training progresses, so does their relationship. Safety Not Guaranteed is the kind of movie that has such a terrific trailer and is such a good concept that it makes you want to call it one of your all-time favorites before even seeing it. And as such, I went in preparing for a letdown that wonderfully never came. I loved this movie with a passion. The endearing characters, the witty dialogue, and the insightful but never heavy-handed message was the perfect change of pace after sitting through big on effects, low on story and humanity blockbusters like Battleship. And the obvious commitment to the material from the filmmakers and cast carried an enthusiasm that was positively infectious. The two central performances are flawless and utterly charming. It's rare to see a love story so equally matched in terms of understanding what these two see in each other. And it's made all the more poignant by the fact that no one else sees it in them. If this movie has a weak point, it's the subplot involving Jeff's search for his old girlfriend, which gets a bit crass at times, but in the end, even that comes around to become a surprisingly effective story and nicely ties into the central themes. Director Colin Trevorrow and writer Derek Connolly tread dangerous ground in that they've obviously fallen deeply in love with their own characters, which can be a huge stumbling block or a great strength, depending on whether the audience can be made to share that love. Fortunately, much like Kenneth himself, their attitude is infectious, and this may be the first romantic comedy I've ever seen where I genuinely fell for both characters. As much as I love The Avengers, this is the movie I admired most this summer and found most thrilling and inspiring. It's a genuine classic that deserves to be seen, and I give it a very enthusiastic A+. I 
loved this Me film. Me too. I, I, I love this one. It's, it's just such a well-written and well-acted movie with, with such great characters that just, like you said, the enthusiasm and passion from the filmmakers and actors is so genuine that it just pulls you into it right. all it, the way. It, it's such a small film, but that's only a good thing. It, yes. it, I felt like I was watching um, a totally unexpected movie uh, at a, a film festival that's just kind of a what's this surprise treat. Well, this is a real independent film. This is not one of those movies that comes from the independent arm of 20th Century Fox right. or Warner Brothers or, or anything like that with a Hollywood, with just a small Hollywood budget. This is a true, small, independent film. And right. The, 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 the highest profile actors in it um, are play supporting roles on Parks and Recreation or 24 with right. Marilyn Reiska in the yeah, cameo. Yeah, Jeff Bridges. Garland, who people recognize as that guy that they didn't really like in that one show that used to be funny, has a small <laughs> bit as uh, as the protagonist's right. father. And that's about as big as we get. But um, last night I was at a screening of People Like Us, the new Chris Pine film, and Mark Duplass popped up in a small role in that, and as soon as his name came up on the ending credits, uh, Sean Means, the critic for the Tribune, and I just started applauding like crazy for his name because he makes such an impression in well, this film. you really think that this character is just going to be a nut, that you just laugh at how crazy he is, and he's kind of introduced that way, and there are certainly elements where you're laughing at his eccentricities. Well, that's but how, still there. Yes, but how much you get pulled into this character and begin to sympathize with him and start to and kind of like him, and then you start to love him. And, and really. identify with yes. him. Yes. I, uh, yeah, I, I came out of this movie thinking, what does it say about me that I came out of this movie so completely identifying with the crazy guy who says he can travel through time? Well, uh, in a way, I, I'd compare it to Forrest Gump. Um, Forrest Gump, to me, is one of the most identifiable characters in film history, and it's not about uh, being simple or slow. It's just the attitude he has and the basic goodness that this character portrays and how he's reacted to the events in his life and the way he chooses, uh, particularly in this case, an almost Don Quixote-esque choice to see the world as it should be rather than it really is. You know, even that subplot that you mentioned that is the weakest aspect of the film does end up tying very well into the themes of the movie in, in a way well. that enhances it. R right. so and, and by the end, you, I spent much of the film thinking, don't cut back to that, I don't care, I'm not that crazy about his performance or his character, and then by the end, he'd won my heart too. This movie just, as corny as it sounds, it just made my heart sore. It just made me, reminded me of why I love movies, why I love life, why, it's, why I get up in the morning. I mean, it's that good a film. It's the most obscure of the films that we're reviewing By today. Far. Like we said, no, no big names. It's, it's not playing in any mainstream theaters or anything like that, I don't think. But it's, it's really well worth people's time to check this one out. Yes, please, please take a moment and look up to see if this film is playing in your area. It is playing at the Megaplex 17 at Jordan Commons. Oh, it is. And kudos to them for giving it a chance and a venue because this is a really terrific film that really deserves your time and attention. After we come back, we'll take a look at acclaimed director Wes Anderson's latest, Moonrise Kingdom. Don't go anywhere. Slick Flicks will be right back. Hi, I'm Carson Robb, and you're watching SLCC TV. Welcome back to this special episode of Slick Flicks, all about the summer movies you're not seeing. Wes Anderson is one of the most popular and acclaimed independent filmmakers working today, and he's just released a new film, Moonrise Kingdom. So tell us, Paul, does Anderson rise with this film, or does he finally fall? He definitely rises. 
Writer-director Wes Anderson is precisely the sort of quirky, offbeat talent that divides critics and audiences into the love him or hate him category. He's the sort of filmmaker whose work can instantly be spotted as his, with a style that is utterly unique. If you already have strong feelings one way or another about Anderson's work, you're likely to know going in what you'll think of his latest effort, Moonrise Kingdom. Sam Chikusky, played by Jared Gilman, a 12-year-old khaki scout, the Boy Scouts are trademarked, abruptly writes a letter of resignation and leaves the camp where he is staying with his troop and their leader, Scoutmaster Randy Ward, played by Edward Norton, leading to a search party involving the police and the khaki scouts. The police are led by Captain Sharp, played by Bruce Willis, though a very different Bruce Willis cop than we're used to seeing. It is soon discovered that Sam's plan is to meet up with a young girl, Susie Bishop, played by Kara Hayward, who has also gone missing. The two met the previous summer and have developed a budding romance. Susie's lawyer parents, played by Bill Murray and Frances McDormand, also become involved in the search. As with any Wes Anderson film, Moonrise Kingdom is driven less by plot than by characters, and his characters here are as memorable, hilarious, and poignant as we've come to expect. The two children do not necessarily establish themselves as great actors, but they are perfectly cast, leading to very effective performances. And the veterans in the supporting cast are all first rate. After disappointing with a string of forgettable performances in films in the 2000s, Edward Norton finally reminds us again why we thought he was so special. Scoutmaster Ward is comically militant and enthusiastic, but rather than being a cartoonish tyrant, he genuinely cares for the boys in the troop. Bill Murray, a staple of nearly every Wes Anderson film, plays one of the most straight-laced characters of his career and gives a great understated dramatic turn. He has some chances to be funny, but not in the ways we'd usually expect from Bill Murray. Frances McDormand is strong as always, and character actor Bob Balaban steals much of the film in his on-screen narrator role. But for me, the standout performance was from Bruce Willis, who again demonstrates that he is a greatly underappreciated actor who can do masterful work when given the chance. Anderson and his co-writer, Roman Coppola, who seems to be the one using the family talent at the moment, have created a film that is likely to be remembered as a classic in years to come. The dialogue is witty and at times uproariously funny. The visual style of the film is a sort of subversive take on Norman Rockwell. And as mentioned before, the characters and performances are first rate. The mix is enchanting, and I give it an A. This was a great movie. I loved this film. And the one slight alteration I would make in your statement about the the kids' performances, I do think Hayward does show some potential to, she to someday be a, a great actress. Uh, the boy does a really terrific job. It's a terrific bit of casting. Ultimately, both of them are more a triumph of casting and direction than conclusive these will be stars performances. Right. But I did think that she showed a spark of some genuine greatness. I agree. One thing that should be said sort of as a qualifier and a word of warning, while this movie is only PG-13 for some fairly mild language and some thematic elements and sexual situations. The one thing that did make me a bit uncomfortable and is going to make some audience members uncomfortable is that there is a moment where the relationship between the two kids, where we're about 12 or 13, somewhere in that range, does take a little bit, does head in a more sexual direction than I was comfortable with and that I think some audience members right. will be comfortable with. I'll be totally honest until you said it right now. I had just assumed this film was an R for that reason. Of, of the movies we represented today, this is actually probably the one that people should be most warned about because that right. aspect, while I believe was actually very tastefully done, given what they were trying to portray, right. it's, it's, still... it's going to freak some people out. So just be warned that that's there. now. Well, enough with that. Let's move on to what is so great about this movie, starting with two simple words, Bruce Willis. He's so understated here, but so... Com so committed. He, yes. He just throws... I love those moments where he just seems to realize, I'm an actor, and just really goes with... You know, you see... you watch the trailers for G.I. Joe Retaliation and 
the Expendables 2, and it's just kind of painful if you're a Willis fan to see him reduced to that kind of by the numbers, where's right. my paycheck? Now, we are going to Burger King afterwards kind of performances, but he just jumps into this with both feet and proves that he is one of the most nuanced actors out there without without getting gimmicky he just absolutely sells the character and he doesn't have to be the over-the-top action hero john mcclain he's just as good as the everyman normal guy with a slight bit of strangeness uh and lovability to him right it's it it's understandable that willis is usually associated with action movies like die hard or with terrible movies like Armageddon and the Fifth Element. So people tend to not think of him this way, but when he does these more dramatic turns, he's, he's so good. Now that Christian Bale has a nomination and award and Gary Oldman has a nomination, Bruce Willis is the top of my personal list of actors who I think are really overdue an Oscar nomination. And, and I'd love to see a supporting actor nod for this one. Be, a, a nomination, at least, because... Yeah. It, it, it's just, it's something really different from him and really delightful. But he's, of course, not the only great performance. Edward Norton, I felt, had, I, toward the end of the 90s, he was, I remember he had given such a great string of performances that when he appeared in Score in 2001, a friend and I were discussing that movie and said, and my friend said it starred Marlon Brando and Robert De Niro and Edward Norton two actors who each had two Academy Awards and one who would someday. And that seemed like a completely reasonable statement uh, in it, 2001. And it, it very, very much seemed like he was going to be the next great one. And he completely stole that film out from under he De Niro and did. Brando. And then he just, it was like he dropped off the face of the earth for the next 10 years. He was still there. He was making movies. But, but he, he wasn't interesting. He, right. he wasn't a presence. This, this was the Edward Norton of... Well, I was going to say this was the Edward Norton of American History X, but no, it's not. It's in not in any way a similar performance to that, but it's Edward Norton, the great actor that we got so excited about in American History X. Right. In terms of the performance, I'd compare it more to... Keeping the Faith? Is Keeping that the, the Faith. Of? That's, yes, that's the one I was trying to think of. It was more in that vein. But it was, honestly, something utterly new. Wes Anderson uh, is just such an interesting director because he has, he has so many unique stylistic elements that are there for almost every one of his films. He's almost as distinctive as Christopher Guest in terms of say, the formula of his specific shot selection, the way he tells the story. He, it's he so you, nobody else would, would tell a story the way he Right. Does. Well, and he has a distinctive visual style where he tends to, particularly as he's introducing characters, he frames his subject in the middle of the frame, like directly dead center, and just does these things that make things just seem a little bit off from the way we'd normally expect them to, to be. Which is really what a Wes Anderson movie is and what... Anderson himself is is something a little off from what we expect, but something well worth watching. This is a really a terrific film that's getting well deserved Oscar buzz. And I have to quickly mention Bill Murray. You know, before this movie started, I was watching the trailer for Hyde Park on Hudson, and just thinking. Bill Murray just isn't a dramatic actor, no matter how hard he tries to pass himself off as one. And I, because I have a personal dislike for Murray's ego and tendency to throw tantrums, I tend to go into all of these movies, despite having grown up a big Murray fan, I go into his more dramatic performances, almost defying him to make me like him. And he does it. He, yeah. he absolutely nailed this character. It's a fantastic performance. I hope that I'm wrong about Hyde Park on Hudson 
and that he is better in the role of FDR than he looks from the trailer. I'd, I'd love to be proven wrong by him because it's an enjoyable experience when I go in saying, yeah, Bill, I'm going to hate you in this movie just to spite you. And he says, tells me, you know what? I may be temperamental, I'm not obnoxious, but I can hit this out of the park. He, uh, he absolutely does that in this yes. one. It's just a great movie all around. And last, we'll be looking at director John Madden's new film, The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. Patrick, is it the best or the worst? I'd say it falls somewhere in between. Seven English seniors experience life changes which result in their coincidental departure to be the first guests at the enticingly pitched Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, a hotel for the elderly and beautiful in Jaipur, India. Recently widowed housewife Evelyn, Judy Dench, must sell her home to cover huge debts. Graham, Tom Wilkinson, a high court judge who lived in India as a boy, abruptly decides to retire and return there. Jean and Doug, Penelope Wilton and Bill Nighy seek a retirement they can afford with the money left after investing in their daughter's internet startup. Muriel, Maggie Smith, a retired housekeeper, needs a hip replacement, which she can get more quickly and inexpensively in India. Wealthy Madge, Celia Emery, hunts another husband, and Norman, Ronald Pickup, is an aging Lothario, still on the make for one-night stands. To varying degrees, they are each overwhelmed by the unfamiliar environment upon their arrival. Furthermore, despite the enthusiastic attitude of its new manager, played by former slumdog millionaire Dev Patel, the hotel is dilapidated and its meals are too spicy for their English palates. It's not the experience they were promised, but as Sonny memorably puts it, our motto here is, everything will be all right at the end. So if it's not all right, it's not the end. Each member of the group is left with a simple choice, be miserable or make the best of things. This movie comes with a distinguished pedigree and a great cast and the director of Shakespeare in Love, John Madden. So it's the kind of, with actors this British, who needs a plot, comedy of manners, they can be quaint and charming, and I really wanted to be swept up in that charm. And the film's talented stars each have memorable moments. But the story, well, it's just flimsy and a bit contrived. And much of the time, we're served up gags instead of comedy. The bit involving Sonny's girlfriend ending up climbing into bed naked alongside Madge, thinking she is surprising her boyfriend, gets a tiny amount of credit from me for being set up pretty well, but it's an obvious bit we've seen before in dozens of farces or sitcoms. And in the end, that's what it comes down to. This movie about finding something new and exciting to grab onto and enjoy in your later years fails to provide anything original. The film is at its best when it centers around Wilkinson as Graham, an aging gay man who had a brief love affair with a boy in India when he was young and has lived a life of regret, not only because they couldn't be together, but because the boy's family reacted so badly to the discovery that Graham has carried around the burden of guilt all of his life. Wilkinson is wonderfully understated and affects no stereotypical mannerisms. He's just a man who happens to be gay, and it's a great bit of acting and the one truly heartfelt aspect of the film. Unfortunately, that plot ends with a shockingly clumsy and heavy-handed bit of symbolism in imagery that was the most embarrassing, I can't believe they stooped to that moment for me in a major movie since Liam Neeson's memory came back after a blow to the head in Unknown. Bill Nighy and Judy Dench both fare quite well, as does Penelope Wilton. The strained relationship between Doug and Jean comes to a head in a moment that is beautiful in the sheer commitment and reality brought to it by these two actors. And it's undeniable that the maturity and life experience infused in these cardboard characters by such outstanding and seasoned performers really does count for a lot. Faring far worse is Dev Patel, who tries hard but succeeds only in making you wish you were watching Slumdog. And there's a comically inept quality to his character that I found to be almost backhandedly racist. This is not a terrible movie, but it's not a particularly good one. It's a cheap, manufactured piece of pop artiness in the old Miramax shock-a-lot style, 
And while it was never as over the top and irritating as that film, and contains stronger characters, it doesn't have anywhere near as much atmosphere as that one did. In the end, this is just another clunker from a once highly promising director. Oh, it's no Captain Corelli's mandolin by any means, but it is a disappointing follow-up to The Debt, which was far from a great film itself, but really did feature many moments of genuine greatness. In the end, this movie just failed to connect with me, and I only give it a C+. The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel is rated PG-13 for profanity and sexual situations. You know, it kind of illustrates some of the inconsistencies of the rating system that Safety Not Guaranteed, which you reviewed earlier, is rated R for profanity and sexual situations. And while the profanity in that one is harsher than in Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, I actually think the sexual situations in Best Exotic Marigold Hotel go further than the Safety Not Guaranteed. Quite a bit so. Now, this film, I have to admit, uh, in, in fairness to the film, that in walking out of the screening from the audience members to the few other members of the press that were there, I kind of left feeling like I watched a different movie maybe than everybody else did because everybody else seemed decidedly more swept up in it. In fact, I even got uh, just a nasty death glare from a woman in the audience when I was talking to the studio rep to, about how I felt about this film. So I don't know if I had a bad attitude, but it just, it didn't grab me, it didn't connect. I, I think I watched tired. the same film that you did, but I enjoyed it a lot more than you did. I, I, I only give it a B. It's, it's probably least among the films we've reviewed today for me. I do agree with your point about it. If you compare it to a movie like Safety Not Guaranteed that feels very passionate and sincere from its filmmakers, this one is, if anything, more polished, but it does have that somewhat manufactured quality. Right. Um, it's kind of an assembly line right. movie. But, but there is a sincerity from some of the performances that really, really did engage me, and I was pulled into the characters because I love the actors so much. You, you compare it to... You, the comparison to an old Miramax movie like Shock a Lot. I see the connection to an old Miramax movie like that, but I, 12 years later, I still write hate letters to Shock a Lot. That's on my all time least well liked movies list. And this is one that had, for whatever, and you know, I, I may have been in somewhat the same situation of being in a, frame, a negative frame of mind for that one, but I hated that movie. And this one, to me, I felt. These, these actors may not have been at their very best, but the actors in that movie, it was like they were sparring with each other. Everybody was trying to steal <laughs> the spotlight uh, uh, from each other, whereas I felt like these actors complemented each other much more. And I, I would completely agree with that statement. Where I, Shock a Lot for me was more atmospheric and charming in its sense of style and storytelling. Um, but both, ultimately, the big comparison for me is that both films had the manufactured feel and had moments where I felt like, could you be any more obvious or treating us any more like you think we're stupid in terms of your use of symbolism? That moment that I mentioned where with... Uh, Graham and the Swan. I won't uh, give it away. Uh, and it, and it, it is the and see, I didn't catch it. I didn't. I, I, I didn't even feel something. Well, I, it it was. It didn't move me or anything. But I, 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 I have to. Admit, I can't see where you're coming from in calling it so obvious and heavy-handed because I just kind of didn't notice it at all. Watch it again and watch for it, and I'm. I know you'll. See. It, 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 it like may it not seemed... bother you as much as it did me, but you will notice how how blatant a, a bit of forced symbolism it is. Possibly, um, I, I have to admit part of it is that we actually disagree. In that, for me, for some reason, Graham's plot was the one that interested me least. Oh, really? Um, Tom Wilkinson is a great actor, one of the very best around. But for some reason, I don't know. There was something about his. Uh, about that plot that actually seemed the most manufactured to me. I think it was partly because it was the 
was where I felt like they were were sticking in the edgy element of things. But I, I didn't I'll get. I'll agree with you I there. didn't come become quite as pulled into that as I did some of the. And this is largely a personal thing. I think I had just recently watched Judy Dench's entire. 1990s British sitcom as time goes by and had developed such a strong love of Judy Dance. I already loved her before, but oh, I really absolutely. had be, had, had such a fondness that that I just so enjoyed every moment she was on screen that I was far more pulled into her character than I was into his. I I, I could see that ultimately. I all I have a long time love of Judy Dench. I had some issues with her character in how they portrayed uh, there was the whole subplot about her experiences with call centers and being dehumanized and I felt like it, it just kind of graded on me how one-sided that story was portrayed that it, it kind of vilified everybody the the work to those places and, and the the attitude and and, and, and I, th I think that's partly a personal perspective thing because I didn't see it that way I thought I I, I did think they were trying to they were kind of making the the dehumanizing element of the of the sort of sales call call center thing sort of a villain but I didn't think the people were being treated as bad. And I, I guess I, I didn't, again, I didn't really pay that much attention to that. I barely noticed that aspect of the story mm -hmm. because to me, every moment she was on screen, what I was paying attention to was that feeling of sadness and loneliness that came mm -hmm. from this woman who's been recently widowed and has no idea what to do with her life now and just wants that human connection with somebody. So I didn't think the call centers were really relevant. What was relevant was the need for one human being to connect with you, with another, and that's that's what I saw. And, and I, in, in, right. in a sense, maybe we did see different movies here, uh -huh. in that it does feel like we we were certainly responding to it emotionally in very different ways. Uh, absolutely, and I think that that's that's overall uh, going back to the statement that you can't guarantee what anyone's going to think of a film. This is an example of that because I, there's a point when I would have thought that this was more my kind of film than your me kind too. of movie. Me too, quite, quite honestly going And it just didn't, it, it didn't work for me. Again, uh, one of my big problems was I felt there were too many labored jokes and I could see them coming before they were going to happen. They didn't make me laugh. Uh, Maggie Smith is another. I'd pay to watch Maggie Smith read the phone Absolutely. book. Absolutely. And she was great. But she starts out as this hateful bigot um, who's quite cartoonish. And then she has one nice scene where you see a little bit of a change. But it's still, she's reduced to a kind of a minor character in an ensemble but she's the one that makes the most gigantic change in attitude. Right. And that, that felt very clunky to me. I enjoyed her performance more than you did, but I don't disagree with you about the character uh, arc. It's, I, I, it's I very clunky. See, I, I loved her performance. I didn't feel the material served the performance well, no, as she, well as it deserved. She, she, no, not at all. She makes that transition far too greatly and far too quickly without a strong enough catalyst to see why she has made this emotional turnaround. She draws more emotion out of it than is deserved, I think, R but the material far. does really gloss over that character's arc, it, 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 almost she, embarrassingly so. Right. It, it, she delved deep to try and find it, and made it work and made you like her in the end, despite the shortcomings that the script gave her. Ultimately, on one hand, my favorite thing about the film is uh, Dev Patel's catchphrase but, line. Now, they use it too many times, but still, it's a great line. If it's, yeah. if it's not, if everything's not all right, then it's not the end. Right. I mean, that, they're trying to be... Life is like a box of chocolates, and it almost succeeds in being that. It has yeah. that level of profundity, but I just found every time he was on screen, I just found it 
to be sitcom -y and just going through the motions that uh, this was not this I just kept thinking about Slumdog Millionaire and feeling like this like I was watching the sitcom adaptation of Slumdog Millionaire that took place later and and maybe it's partly because in my mind when I was seeing him on screen I would uh, I Slumdog Millionaire is one of my favorite movies of the past several years and then Dev Patel followed that up with M. Night Shyamalan's The Last Airbender. And so, for me, I wasn't thinking that this was a step down from Slumdog Millionaire. Every time he was on screen, I was thinking what a step up this was from The Last Airbender. And I quite enjoyed his performance, even though I did feel there were a lot of cartoonish, cliched elements in his plot. I still was finding myself very much enjoying the movie whenever he was on screen. I could see that, but honestly... In some ways, I almost enjoyed him more in Airbender. I did, even I, though it was a far worse performance, it was just it was something different, and it was, it was mildly interesting to me and to see, see I him did, in something. I, I did. I, I, I felt like this was different from Slum, Slumdog Millionaire. I didn't see the characters as similar at all, because the Slumdog Millionaire character is completely innocent and good-hearted and lovable, and while while his character here, Sonny, is a good guy. He's also this sort of scheming wheeler dealer who's right. trying. Well, he's trying to be one. He's not very good at it, but right. he uh, is. He, he, he's got that slightly underhanded side. He's the lovable bad boy here, which to me is a very different thing from Slug Dog Millionaire. Even though I'll grant you that they are playing off of the same sort of romantic dynamic, and it's easy to. In, in my mind, I look back at this movie and I remember his love interest as Frida Pinto from Slumdog Millionaire. Uh, 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 right. But I think that and, his and characters in the two films, if you really look closely, are not similar at all. I, I think it's a fair point. Ultimately, I didn't buy the performance or the character and it didn't work for me. A, a, and I did. And I think that that really is what it comes down to with this movie is that we see each other's point of view, but in the end, the movie worked for me and it didn't work for you. Agreed. So that's it for this episode of Slick Flicks. Until next time, please remember to turn off your cell phones and don't talk to the screen. It can't hear you.